and welcome to the newest edition of Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette, and so happy to be here with you this evening. My, I am broadcasting live via SHR Media and streaming live here on Facebook. And my guests this evening are Rocky and Cheryl Detweiler. They are best-selling authors and speakers. Tonight, they're going to speak with us about how to choose better words and successfully navigate difficult conversations in business. I'm excited to talk about that topic as uh, I've had difficulty in this area. I'm sure some of you have too. And then the second hour, we're going to have another interesting topic in business with uh, Dr. Nicole K- Kelly, she's going to talk to us about how to keep Me Too from being you two. And actually, that is uh, Rocky and Cheryl Detweiler calling in now. They had to to run real quick. So let me just grab that real fast. Uh, Hi. I I told them that you had to call me right back. I'm in the middle of my open. Uh, Rocky Detweiler, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I'm just in the middle of my open, and I will continue if you don't mind (laughs) Uh, with my open since since, uh, somebody popped into your office, which happens sometimes uh, during live radio. Um, But anywho, my second hour... Uh, we're gonna talk. We're gonna talk to uh, Dr. Nicole Kelly, who's gonna tell us how to keep Me Too from being You Too. And uh, no one wants to be You Too. That is for sure. Uh, I know a lot of women, including myself, who have been uh, in the Me Too uh, territory. And as a card-carrying conservative, that's a, a difficult. Uh, it's a difficult space to be in because the Me Too agenda has, quite frankly morphed into some ugly things. And I want to give a shout out to uh, a couple of my sponsors that are showing up in the Facey chat. Uh, Mr. Robert Houston, Mr. John Campbell, how are you? Thank you so much for supporting the show. I am most appreciative. And while I am giving uh, shout outs to my sponsors, Eva Rosenberg, uh, who is in the midst of tax season. Uh, I hope you are doing well, Eva Rosenberg, a.k.a. the Tax Mama. She's out there in uh, California, I'm sure, taking very good care of all of her tax clients and selling plenty of books called uh, tax, Trump Tax Cut <laughs> and taking care of her many, many clients. And, uh, of course, I thank her for uh, supporting the show. Hello, Susan Tui, Jared Tatum. How are you? And everyone in the Facey chat, those of you I missed, I apologize. Mark Bonner, how are you? Um, but very good guests that I have on the show tonight. I already talked about you, Rocky, and Cheryl uh, Detweiler, and I appreciate having you on the show tonight. I'm very excited to talk about how to choose better words. Apparently, um, and I'll, I'll share that story with you later when we, when we uh, get into the meat of the show, one, one, uh, one at least bad story that I have to tell about how perhaps I did not choose great words and got myself in trouble. Uh, <laughs> in business, imagine, imagine that. And any, it, my audience members can tell you that um, I have a rather large um, mouth and talk a lot. I was talking to someone uh, in politics earlier today, and I was saying how um, there are people who don't like me he said why because you speak your mind and i said well that's you know part of it (laughs) that's one reason that's one of several that's a long list of reasons why some people don't like me i have something called a backbone but there's (laughs) I, i tend to speak my mind from time to time okay a lot okay most of the time but i i try to be tactful about it I really do, and diplomatic, but you know, it doesn't always come out that way. Just saying. So people get mad, <laughs> like dogs. But anyway, but so I think your I think your conversation is going to be most helpful, and I think the audience is going to be really appreciative of what you had to say. Are you Are you rustling papers or something? I I'm getting a lot of like. I'm hearing a lot of background noise. I hear a lot of, a lot of, okay, it stopped. Cool. Okay. So um, I did a, a quick little live before I, I, I started the show. Um, and 
Listen, I was gone last week and I apologize. I was supposed to do a show. I had to run out of town and I wasn't feeling well and just ended up being a bad week. For those of you who caught some of my Facebook lives or didn't catch any of my Facebook lives during CPAC, you should go to moneytalkwithmelanie.com. I did a couple of live interviews from the Conservative Political Action Conference. I wanted to tell you some of the live interviews that I did. If you go to moneytalkwithmelanie.com, you can catch them. I did a live chat with Senator Ted Harvey. Um, We talked about the latest things that are going on with China, with President Trump, we did a lot. We, we, we talked a lot. He is the chairman for the Committee to Defend the President. I always joke with him about having the toughest, one of the toughest jobs in the country because he's the chairman for the Committee to Defend the President. But he's on Fox News all the time, and he really just does a fantastic job, I think. So if you go to MoneyTalkWithMelanie.com, you can catch that interview live from CPAC. You can also catch my interview with... Um, with uh, with uh, 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 Peggy Hubbard. If you don't know who, who she is, she was known for a while as the angry black mom from Ferguson. She's a, a Navy veteran, former police officer, um, and she speaks a lot against um, Black Lives Matter, believe it or not. I did a raw interview with her. She became a YouTube sensation, and uh, I did a raw interview with her. She's running for Senate. She's now a Senate candidate. Um, and I did a raw interview with her from CPAC. You can check that out on moneytalkwithmelanie.com. It actually was a really fun interview. I also did uh, w- one of the interviews I'm most proud of from CPAC is an interview with Angel Parents, Maryam Mendoza and Steve Ronnebeck. And actually, if you just caught um, the uh, readout from the um, the legislation that President Trump just vetoed, uh, Angel Parents, Mary Ann Mendoza, and Steve Ronnebeck were j- just spoke. These are the same Angel Parents that I interviewed from CPAC. That's on MoneyTalkWithMelanie.com. You can find the link there. I interviewed them as well. And then the last raw interview that I did from CPAC um, was with uh, Chris Cox, who is the founder of Bikers for Trump. Sylvia Lockwood, one of my favorite people. I see you in the facey chat there. How are you, darling? Big hugs. Sylvia Donahue. Sylvia Donahue. Sylvia Lockwood is one of my best friends. Only lives four seconds from me. I was just thinking about you today, darling. I need to call you. Um, Chris Cox, the founder of Bikers for Trump, is uh, one of the last interviews that I did from CPAC. You might want to check that out. Who knew that bikers would be a uh, demographic? But this this actually speaks to um, one of the things that I, I, I really feel strongly about as far as demographics, especially as a brown person. It is my contention that demographics has a lot more to do with things like your hobbies then it has to do with the color of your skin hey ted please love you honey <laughs> hello to you has a lot more to do with things like socioeconomics and your hobbies and things that you, and things that you have in common your skin color is a descriptor and nothing more and people get really pissed off when i say that but i i, I really just feel super strongly about that Historically speaking, yes, I get that it there's historical significance to our skin color. But Dr. King's whole goal was that we got to a point where we we judge people by their content of character and that our skin color was not as relevant. That's the goal. And that the things that we have in common had to do more with our character than anything else. And so bikers have an interest together, biking. That's what they love. That's what they're passionate about. And so that, that, that particular interview is just very, it very, was very interesting to me. And, and I, I learned a lot from that interview. One of the things that I love about what I do in the media is that I get to learn so much from my guests every, th- every single day. And it's the, the goal toward which I press, so to speak, is to kind of prove my theory that we are so much more than our physical attributes. And talking to Chris Cox just kind of 
helps in that regard. So um, I hope you get to check out some of those some of those interviews. I got in a big t- Twitter roar with somebody today because it, it, somebody tweeted at me, um, Melon <laughs> at NJGOP Diva thinks we all uh, look the same and our color doesn't matter. And I said, I don't think we all look the same. And I and it's not that I it's not that I don't think our color matters. It's just that I think our character matters more. I don't think our color is some big, huge accomplishment. I think accomplishing a good character is what matters. I didn't do anything to be brown, but be born. I mean, like, congratulations, mom and dad, for making me, and I appreciated it and all, but I didn't do anything. Trying to work on what's in my heart and, and being a good person is where the accomplishment lies, frankly. So, I, I mean, and I'm sorry that people hate hearing that. <laughs> See what I mean? See what I mean, uh, Detweilers? <laughs> how I end up pissing people off? <laughs> I, say, I say horrible things like that, and it ends up making people really mad. <laughs> so, apparently. Apparently, these are the things that make people really angry. But I... And you know, you, you're not proud of being black. I'm like, proud of, pr- why should I be proud of it? I didn't do anything. But anyway, so <laughs> you're listening to Money Talk Melody. <laughs> I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette. We're going to take a brief break and allow the, uh, the Detweilers to recover from what I just said. And uh, we'll be right back. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> But once in a while, my pet and I would view the three stooges, Larry, Curly, and Moe, for laugh. Hello, I'm Ron Edwards. On today's page from the Edwards Notebook, today there is a new three stooges in Congress. Rashida Tlaib, who fights for Palestinian causes. Iman Omar of Minnesota, who doesn't support our values or good principles that made America the envy of the world. And there's Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the big time in her own mind socialist, who lets everyone know she's the boss. Unlike the original Three Stooges, the new congressional ones are a clear and present danger to our society, along with many others in Congress who are in government to accelerate America's decline and to bolster our enemies. The new Three Stooges support the destruction of our economy and Israel, along with forcing us to live without our unalienable rights and the denial of God-given right to life for newborn babies. And, of course, trample President Trump. I think it's high time to disband government schools and restore authentic education. I'm Ron Edwards. Let's meet every Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific on AmericaMatters.us, SHR Media, and at 12 a.m. Sunday on Talk America Radio Network. Ron Edwards, the new voice of America. Sponsored by David E. Garrett Jewelers. Making a living can be tough these days with so many jobs going overseas. If you love numbers and puzzles and want job security, you can become a tax specialist with an amazing six-month tax course from Tax Mama. Operate your own tax practice locally or anywhere in the world where there are American taxpayers. It's a great way to write off your trips to visit family for months at a time. Everything you need to pass the IRS three special enrollment examinations is included in this course. Visit irsexams.school. And if you need more than six months, that's okay. Take your time. You're in the course until you pass the exams or until you unsubscribe and reject Tax Mama's emails. Right now, you can get the credit you deserve. Just visit MrCreditRepair.biz. Let their expert credit repair specialist remove late payments, charge-offs, collections, even old bankruptcies fast and easy. That's MrCreditRepair.biz. Why go anyplace else? Increase your credit score today. At Mr. Credit, you always get a quality service all at our everyday discounted price. Stop getting turned down for cars, credit cards, or even new homes. Visit MrCreditRepair.biz today. That's M. MrCreditRepair.biz. Your credit repair is our number one priority. And we're back. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette. And my next guest, I hope I'm pronouncing their last name correctly. I meant to check before we got on the air, but as usual, I forgot. 
I apologize for that. Uh, their, their names are Rocky and Cheryl Detweiler. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Uh, as seen on uh, A&E, ABC, ESPN, Fox, and NBC reality TV stars, Rocky and Cheryl Detweiler are professional speakers, best-selling authors, mindset mentors, and trainers that teach people how to use the power of words to positively change their thoughts, words, and actions so they can thrive. People can't find the confidence to move forward in an increasingly negative world to the comparison, competition, and conflict. Uh, Rocky and Cheryl's proven principles create a culture of positivity, and positivity transforms. And when you transform yourself and those around you, you can transform your business. I could not agree more. And without further ado, Cheryl and Rocky Detweiler. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Hello, are yes, you? you are actually. Ah, ah, thank goodness. It's perfect. Thank goodness. <laughs> Welcome to Money Talk with Melanie. How are you? Are you okay? Are you? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm doing great. Wonderful. And to your comment at the start, I actually love outspoken people. So I have no problem with you sharing your opinions. And I think that's a little different than being disrespectful towards others for their opinion. So I don't have a problem with anything you've said so far. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. Cause sometimes, usually I get an opportunity to warn people, like when I call them ahead of time, but unfortunately you guys had to go and I was like, oh boy. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't get a chance to, <laughs> to warn them a little bit about my style and I hope they're going to like be okay. <laughs> Oh, I love it. I think there's nothing wrong with that at all. And, you know, in a place of business, um, which is usually where we find ourselves coaching and training, that's where the power of words can come in. When people are too outspoken and they actually judge others for their opinions and they present their own opinions in a way that, like, they're right, you're wrong, that's where you can get that conflict going on. I didn't hear any of that from you. I just heard, hey, this is how I feel. And unfortunately, you're in a position, Melanie, that people are going to judge it no matter what you say. So, <laughs> Well, it's very true. And I, and I will say this. What I find is that, some, that sometimes, particularly in the political arena, it seems these days, that people are not okay with just letting other people have their opinion. And I don't uh, quite understand that. They're like not okay with people just like having their opinion. Like that's my political that opi so opinion. And they're not okay with that. Which is so funny because our country was founded on the idea that we should all have our own opinions. And that's why we have multiple parties and, so to get so ugly about it and expect us all to be on the same page is, in my opinion, kind of ridiculous. And, you know, we're never going to be there. We're all different on purpose. It's it's our differences that make us stronger. Right. Like, it, it was designed so that we're supposed to be okay with that. Like, it, it, mm -hmm. it, it's, supposed exactly. to be, it's supposed to be all right. So I'm not... I, I, exactly. I, are we using, are we using, are we not using the appropriate terms? And, and, I, and, I, and I'm not talking, I'm talking about on either side. Are, are there terms that both sides or either sides could be using? Could we be using better terms on both sides to make people more comfortable or, or, or nicer, more accepting of uh, um, oh my goodness! Um, I think, <laughs> did I just I think ask a loaded that's question? That's a resounding. <laughs> <laughs> a resounding. That is a resounding yes. <laughs> oh my goodness, that is such an understatement. But yeah, it just comes across so ugly and so accusing and judging every action, every word, every movement in a negative light because it's not how we see that it should be done and. Um, that's that negativity that comes in in the workplace, in politics, in the media. And that's where, I mean, you're cutting people down left and right with your words, with your tone, with what, how you're choosing to communicate, rather than having the expectation that, yeah, we all have different opinions here, and that's okay. We're still, our differences make us stronger as a country, and let's use that, and let's move forward. This is true. Now, <sighs> It gets so difficult, though, right? Because I, you know, when it comes to 
the political, I know we're talking about business, right? But when it comes to political aspects and the media aspects, it's all about, tr- it, it, in politics, we don't play fair, right? Like we're trying to, yeah. we're trying to manipulate. I happen to also be involved in politics. So, you know, we're trying to unfairly, it's a blood sport, as, as one person when I first got involved told me. So, you know, we're trying to win. We're trying to manipulate other people. Like, it's, it's no longer about trying to persuade. It's about trying to manipulate at this point. We're no longer trying I to. I agree with you. Yeah. You know, we're no longer <laughs> trying to like honestly get somebody to see our side. Now we're trying to just get people to vote our way, whether it's honest or not. You know, that's true, and that's unfortunate, but that is so very true, Melanie. You know what I mean? Now, for me, mm-hmm. I'm the kind of person where, like, I honestly would like the person to completely understand the point and genuinely may have a, a transformative moment where they, where they, under, you know what I mean? Oh, I know. But that's not. And you w- can see the light bulb come on. <laughs> right. But that that's, would be amazing. Yes. Right. Like I was, I was on my way to a fundraiser last night and I was talking to somebody about it and, and, and I said, no, I actually legitimately like this candidate. I said, if I didn't, I wouldn't be going to this fundraiser. And they were like, yeah, well, that's you. Cause like, that's the kind of person that you are. <laughs> but, but there's other people who are involved in politics who, you know, wouldn't care. They would just go, you know, I, I won't be photographed yeah, with certain true. politicians that don't, you know, believe what I believe in. I'm like, yeah, I'm not being photographed with that person because they're pro choice. Like, no. <laughs> so, like, they're, they're kind of like, I'm pro life. Yeah, they're, they're Republican, but they're pro choice. So I'm out. Like, <laughs> so I'm not, but wow. yeah, that's how I am. Like, even though I'm involved politically, like, if they don't believe the same thing, I believe I'm out. So, <laughs> so gotcha. Yeah. So, well, how, what kind of words can we? What kind, like, if you were to, do you ever work with politicians or do you just work with business people? I'm curious. Honestly, most of the time we work with business people, entrepreneurs, uh, work with companies and the inner dynamics within companies that happen. Um, you know, the pol- politics and politicians, that would be a new realm. We haven't really delved into much. Because I feel like um, I know somebody. Worked with local- I feel like I know somebody who could use your help. I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I think that would definitely be a very challenging realm because you're right. That is an area where manipulation is used. You're trying to sway people's votes in any way that you can. So that's a little different than just having issues with employees and trying to develop your people um, and how you're speaking to them and coaching them and, and, you know, whether you're, cutting them down all the time. It, it is a different arena and it would be quite challenging. It would be. Okay. So in an office setting, in a, uh, it does, does it just work for now? I'm in education. Does it just work only in a business setting? What about, and is it, is it, do your methods work the same way in business as it does say in a public sector situation? It, it, is it transferable? You know what I mean? Oh, yes. We've found that it's across the board. It doesn't matter if it's a small organization up to a huge corporation. They all have the same. We're all people. We all treat each other. We should treat each other with respect. If we don't, there's problems. Um, And that's where it gets ugly, even in the political realm. As soon as you start exerting your own beliefs in a manner that's disrespectful to those around you and you don't care, you're going to have problems. So it's a matter of showing that showing the person that you have charge of that you care about them. Well, and if you think about it, like, you know, we speak to certain people in our lives differently. If I was to take a message to my mom, she's doing something that's uh, bothering me. I'm not going to approach her like I would some person I work with that's a coworker that's annoyed me for three years and I don't care if I ever see again or something, you know, I might use some really ugly words and tone of voice with that coworker that I would never use with my mom, 
because she's part of my family and I want her to remain part of my life the rest of my life, you know? <laughs> so sure. I think we lose sight of that. We lose sight that these are people. And even though we don't have a lasting relationship with them, we should still treat them on that level and expect that treatment in return. We've been in companies where there's a CEO that just walks around like he's king and can say anything he wants to anybody. And there is usually some major problems in that company as a result. Uh, the productivity is down. You've got people bouncing and going to new jobs. They can't, they can't keep the good people and they wonder why. And it starts at the top and it trickles down. The, are, in those situations, are the CEOs usually completely unaware that there's a correlation between their usually, yes. rate of attrition <laughs> and, and, and their behavior? Oh, yes. The worst of the worst ones we have seen most definitely. And there's almost this like fear, you know, driven feeling throughout the company. There's no open door. They'll say, I've got an open door. You can come talk to me about anything, but there's a definite chain of command. They don't want to be bothered. I don't want to hear it unless it's something that, you know, I think is important. It is just crazy to see the situations that happen out there. And it's all because they, I guess it starts with a fundamentalist on the inside. They just don't care enough about other people to be cautious of what it is they're saying to them. I had a, I, I actually had a, a situation like that recently where so, somebody in authority said that. And, and like, I literally did that, got retaliated against. And then like a couple meetings later, that person said that in a meeting, like that he was o open and, and warm and fuzzy. And anybody who knows me will tell you that poker, like you can describe me in a lot of ways, but poker face is like not one of those word phrases you would use. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I almost literally laughed out loud. Like, really? Because, bro. Like, you literally retaliated. Like, retaliated big time, unequivocally retaliated. Like, you have an open door? Like, unequivocally, no doubt, I got a lawyer, you retaliated. Like, like are you serious? Wow. Yeah! <laughs> uh, oh, my goodness. Like, well, and then you get the two kinds of people. Like when it, you've got two kinds of people, when somebody's confronted with something that, that hurts and bothers them, they're either going to react right away and they're going to jump to where they want to win. And they will use their words, their tone of voice, they'll raise their voice. This could be in a meeting, it could be anywhere, it could be in a debate. They feel attacked, they're going to come back and they're going to attack back then you've got the other side of the coin the other people that when they feel attacked they just go into their shell and they get quiet and they're reserved and so depending on which side you go to either way you don't have good communication and you know you can't have good clear communication and actually achieve or get that light bulb effect where you can understand each other unless you can stop attacking right and you know, that's what happened. Like, he raised his voice, and I was like, yeah, you, I, I, like, I'm too old for that. Like, I, I don't, mm-mm. <laughs> like, you know, you. you know, I'm, So what happened? I Did don't, you come back at him, or? No! I, no, listen. Oh, good. I don't look as old as I am. And I don't think he realizes how old I am. And after that, like, he tried to go for seconds. And I told him, uh, uh, no, mm -mm. you don't talk to my lawyer. We're not doing that. <laughs> oh, good for you. Just stop him. Stop him in his tracks. I, I mean, that's the way to do it. Yeah, like, uh, no, you're, you're not. So you, you yell at me one day, and you're going to call me back to your office a second day so you can yell at me again? No, we're not. No, we're not. <laughs> no, actually, well, and, that's not what we're doing. <laughs> like, yeah. No, well, we're not. We have found, you know, because that's the ridiculous. Power of words. Your words that you use, I mean, and that you choose to use, and the tone of voice you choose to to use it with, I mean, that's everything. That's our form of communication. 
And that speaks more of our character than anything we can do in our actions towards other people. So how can, is there a way to diffuse that situation? Is there, now what happened was I, I got upset about something that the person did. So I sent an email. I put, I put in an email for a couple of reasons. I wanted to make sure that I did not misconstrue what the person said. I wanted to make sure that I was accurate in what the person said. And that's why I put in an email. And because I was really upset, I wanted to articulate what I wanted to communicate in a non-emotional way. That's why I put it in writing. Um, And I waited 24 hours before I did it because I was pissed, (laughs) to be honest. (laughs) Well, good for you. That's actually really wise. Good for you. That's what I thought. (laughs) So I was really angry. And the the video would have went viral had I addressed it at the moment that it happened. So, (laughs) so... Exactly. And the person was still really upset. So the person was upset when he when he got the email. I called into the office and then he kind of yelled at me and called me on some other stuff and was like really mad. And then called me in his office like uh. the next day for some other foolishness. And I was like, I'm not coming to your office. Whatever you need to do, put it in writing. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not doing it. And you see my lawyer. And you'll see my lawyer about it because this is foolishness. Like you're retaliating, and no. Mm-hmm. So, I, like I didn't really see how I could have approached it any other way. I was just really, I was really upset, and I felt like I had every right to express that I was upset with what was said. I what I thought was going to happen was he was going to say, "Let's talk about why you were upset," but instead he was like. Let's talk about some other foolishness. <laughs> With, like uh-huh. retaliatory foolishness. Oh man. Yeah. And then like the when next you day can't help some people. Right. Wow. <laughs> right. Let, let me raise my voice and yell at you about some other retaliatory foolishness that I would have never brought up had you not emailed me. Really was what it was. <laughs> That's right. So, <laughs> yeah. So that that like literally <laughs> Like literally in the eight or so some odd years I've been doing this, no one's ever talked to me about ever. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, and I was like, yeah, this is no, like this is the second day in a row. Uh-uh. Nope. We're not doing that. So, and I don't think, I don't think that person expected me to that response. So. Uh, well, good. But. What do you recommend? But I think had I not had I not invoked the lawyer situation, I think it would have turned out differently. And that's the problem. So possibly, you know what I mean. So what would you recommend if you're not in a position like if I if I didn't have if I wasn't well connected, which I am? What would you recommend <laughs> otherwise? That's a difficult one because you run across people like that that just will try to railroad you. And you you can't stoop to their level. You can't come yelling back. You can't use the same words they're using. But at the same time, you should not leave yourself in a position to be abused by them or to continue taking that because you don't deserve it either. So you put up your boundaries. You put up your wall. Depending on the situation, um, you diffuse it as best you can to get out and get away. And some people, like, I I would agree with you in that case. This is a rare, rare case here with this individual and the way they sound. By you calling in a lawyer, that was enough to get them to stop and back off. Um, But, you know, in business, you don't always have to do business with people that are going to talk to you like that. If it's your boss, that's another thing. That's where you have to have those difficult conversations and say, hey, when you talk like that, it hurts me. It makes me feel attacked. I will not put up with that but you can say it in a way that's respectful and they are forced to listen and if not I guess then you have the choice of going somewhere else yeah that's true that's true because unfortunately there are people out there that just don't care usually there's not that many usually if they have any kind of regard for you or 
if it's in business, they like your work that you're doing for them and they don't want to lose you as an employee, they're going to listen. You can at least express to them that what they're saying is not right and not going to be tolerated. Now, or, or th- that's true. Now, are there ways that you can be proactive and be a and be a positive employee all the time? Like maybe you are not the most positive person to begin with and don't realize it. You know what I mean? Are there ways that you yes, can get, that you can wreck it? <laughs> and because some people are just not positive. You know what I mean? Some people are just like neg- negative Nancy's, Debbie Downers. You ever see that skit on Saturday Night Live where you're just like, you know, every, you know, you have some people that see a silver lining all the time. So, but you have those other people that the glass is just always that going half empty. You know, maybe you don't, rec- maybe that you don't is true. recognize yourself as that person. How do you recognize yourself as that person and how you turn that around? So, if I may, I can go ahead and uh, address this question, Melanie. Oh, is there a dude here? uh, Actually, (laughs) what's that? I said, oh, is there a dude here? Hey, I'm kidding. (laughs) There is a dude here. There absolutely is a dude on here. So, uh, I think I can help with this. Um, We actually addressed this with a company we were working with, and the lady literally referenced herself as a negative Nancy in a open environment in the community she was working in. And so when we addressed that, um, when she said that like three times in a meeting, um, you know, and then it was true, right? She, so she verbalized exactly what it was she became. And, and she was, a, it was a bit of a challenge. So we, what we do is we bring, um, you know, the positivity to the environment that we're working in. If it's negative, we just bring positivity. We, we bring it in with our book. We bring it with our journal. We talk about it. We talk about changing your conversation. We get them engaged in writing in their journal where they write down three things that they're grateful for. We find things in their life that they can do that are very simple that they can address on a daily basis. And it has to be taken um, seriously. Otherwise, you're going to go right back to your old ways and you're going to be a negative Nancy. And so... Um, this lady actually started, she, she recognized that she was a negative Nancy. And so that's the first thing, right? And the second thing was that she decided to take action. So if someone's not going to want to change their old ways and be negative, there's not much you can do with those helpless, uh, unfortunate people. You have to want to work, you know, people, you have to work with people that want to be worked with, right? You know, it's the same thing in life. Yeah, spend time with people who want to spend time with you. You don't have enough time to spend it with stupid people or dumb people that don't want to hang around you, right? So hang around with good people. <laughs> so I say the same thing here, right? Work with people that want to work and they want to change. And so we did. And um, she, in a very short period of time, time, changed her thinking. And I told her, I said, Neg- I said, Nancy, when you're around me, don't ever reference yourself as negative Nancy. I don't want it. I don't personally want to hear that. Because I don't believe you're negative. I don't, I don't think you need to reference yourself as negativity. And the people around you do not need to hear that, okay? Yeah. And so she got it. She took the coaching. And we addressed that. And let me tell you, she changed her life. She I changed her it. life at home. She changed her life in the community. She changed her life in her, uh, in her business. And so we address those things. We talk about the things that are hard to talk about. Just like you talk about politics and it's hard. We talk about life stuff. This is these are life skills that people don't know how to master. They don't know how to master their own, um, you know, their own hookups or their own hangups. They don't know how to master, you know, me being negative and, you know, how come nobody wants to be around me? How come my life sucks? How come I'm so fat? I mean, all these things, right? People don't. I, I mean, it's simple, but people don't know how to do it. So that's what we teach and train, and it's fairly simple. And it begins with your thoughts. They become your words that become your actions, and that's what we wrote a book about. So, you know, it can take place in our government if it wanted to, but you're dealing with a fairly broken, you know, um, a mechanism. It's, it's, a, it's a device that I don't know if we're going to see a lot of a great changing because people don't necessarily want to change. Uh, you're absolutely right. You know, I had yesterday in, my, in one of my classes, I had a little pep talk. I don't know how it, we got on the topic, but I said to one of my classes, I said, I am sick and tired of people speaking victimhood into you guys. I said that when they should yeah. be speaking victory. 
I said, I am tired. It, uh-huh. it was actually one of my, one of my, I call, I call everybody brown instead of black. Cause I know what color black is and I know what color brown is and I'm brown. So but that's another topic, but uh, <laughs> it's a topic for another day. I love that. But I said, I said to them, "Listen, uh, I don't care if you're brown or black or white. I have no issue with you either way. It doesn't right. matter to me what color you are." But I said to them, "I said I am sick and tired of them speaking victimhood into you instead of victory." I said, it's a bunch of buffoonery, and I'm tired of it. And I said, I don't care who knows. I said, did you know? I said, you heard of Frederick Douglass, but did you know that he died a millionaire? No. I said, all you hear about is trials and the hardships, but you never hear about the victory. I said, and I'm tired of uh-huh. it. I said, I'm sick and tired of them speaking that victimhood foolishness into you, right? So <laughs> one of the white kids said, Miss Collette, we need to hear, I said, we need like that 30 second speech every day. Can you do that uh-huh. every day? That's what one of my students, and I, cause I said to the white, I, I pointed at the white kid, I said, you heard, said you heard of Frederick Douglass, right? He said, yeah. I said, you know, he died a millionaire. He said, no. I said, cause nobody taught you that, did that? He said, nope. I said, exactly. I said, that's that victimhood foolishness. They keep teaching you all every day. And I said, I'm so tired of it. I said, I'm tired. <laughs> right? <laughs> they were just, and the kids' oh, eyes were so awesome. big. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm just exhausted. I've had it. <laughs> so, and I said. But that's a huge shift. That's a huge change. If you keep yourself mentally in a place where you're a victim, you're limiting yourself from all kinds of potential in your life. And nothing's your fault and nothing goes your way because you can't help it versus taking control and doing something about it. Exactly. Exactly. So I was telling one of my friends that I said that to one of my classes and he was like, tell it, girl. And I said, yup, and I'll be in the principal's office in three, two, one. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> but, but I mean, it, it, it's, it's a, you wonder why our kids are not being successful, but it's what you're talking about. We're not putting positivity in these kids head minds and hearts like put positivity there instead of negativity like Uh what are we doing well melanie that's obviously that's obviously what we stand for i mean that's you know we were in new york city and we were coaching and training on this is what we're this is what our whole business model is about it's it's always about positivity we wear the words we talk about the words we wrote on the words. you know we wrote book on it i mean so when it comes to positivity, I mean, that, that changes companies, cultures, organizations. It'll change schools. We've seen it save lives. I mean, there's so many things to positivity that, you know, you're going to start feeling better about yourself. You're going to start feeling better just in generally health, healthy-wise if you just start feeling positive and start speaking positive because it affects your entire life. It really does. It does. And it's as much a choice as negativity is. Whether you realize it or not, being negative is as much a choice as choosing to be positive. I realize it is, but but we don't we mm-hmm. don't tell our students that we don't tell other people that. Just like you told that grown up that we don't tell our kids that in the classroom. And that was a, mm. an issue that I had with um, a, another a, adult. I'll put it that way. That, that got me in trouble. Somebody said that we have to consider kids' environment and where they come from when we write them up, and that got me incensed, and that's how I got in trouble. <laughs> oh, man. That's what got me in trouble, and I was like, that was highly insulting. So I, yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. like, no, we don't. So, you know, and I said to my class, I said, did you hear about the kid from Detroit that got 41 college offers? He's the the son of a single mother. Did you hear about Booker T. Washington, who was a former slave and educated himself on the dirt floor after 12 hours of work? Did you hear about, and I can go on and on and on. Did you hear about Condoleezza Rice, who was the parent and uh, <laughs> uh, who, who, who grew up in the segregated South? Did you hear about Dr. Ben Carson, whose mother couldn't even read and, ba- and 
and operated on babies' brains. Did you hear? Like, I can go on and on and on and on and on. But mm -hmm. no one ever. And on what you focus on. Exactly. And it's about decision. You know what Dr. Ben Carson's mother used to do? Pretend that she could read. She could not read. The woman could not read. Wow. That's right. But no one. Wow. It's all about decisions. But no. Uh -huh. Let's consider that he didn't have a father. And let, let's talk about the, in this day and age, they would say, well, you know, he doesn't have a dad in home. So let's just focus on that negative circumstance and just let him fall through the cracks. Forget it. Let's just exactly. do that. And now think of all the babies that he saved. So it, uh -huh. it's. Wow. Exactly. So, and that's the thing about public school, like you guys are talking about in business and all the positivity is all a matter of your thinking. It's all a matter of the changes that can take place when you think positive, when you shift your focus. And, and yep. I, I just, I, I, I it's so sad when you have this and, and and frankly you know what you guys are fixing in my mind is what is what the schools have fa have failed to do are, are people that ah. are people that we failed to fix <laughs> and i offer my apologies <laughs> as a public school <laughs> teacher my my, my 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 bad so, sorry <laughs> sorry about that <laughs> So now you got a bunch of, you know, CEOs and employees running around, not fixed, because I, I, you know, we couldn't catch them while they were in school. But Exactly. That's great. <laughs> I'm just saying, because we told them, you know, they were, they were screwed up and there was no way to fix it. But, it, but, it's but we've seen the same thing in, um, we've been pulled into high schools and junior high schools and middle schools. And the same thing, kind of what you're talking about, taking away that victim mentality. We've been called in to work with at-risk kids and been told they're at risk. And then Rocky will get to talking to them, and he'll tell them straight out. It's like, you guys aren't at risk to me. You're a future sitting right here. You're our inventors, our CEOs, our future company owners. Like, I see so much potential in you. And he just builds them up. It's something that should be done on a daily basis. You're right. Exactly. And I mean, I teach financial literacy to, to teenagers. Wow. And I'm thinking to myself, you got the whole world in front of you. And I'm teaching you financial yep. lit. Like, you got it right <laughs> here. Okay, I get that yeah. you might think that you don't need no offense to math teachers, how to do a quadratic equation. All right, fine. But I'm teaching you how to do investing and you're 17 and haven't had your first serious job yet. Like, dude. Exactly. <laughs> wow. That is like, awesome. You know what I'm saying? And like, you got all the possibilities in the world. Charles Payne on Fox, like, that's where he started out. You got... Uh. That's awesome. Every possibility in front of you. All is not lost because you don't have no, a daddy at home or, or no parents at home or you have a dr drug addict family. You still got every possibility in the world because you live in the greatest country on earth. It, 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 it doesn't. I love that you instill that in them too. And that you take away that victim mentality. I mean, in our workshops, a lot of times we will um, reference Victor Frankl. He was a survivor of concentration camps um, back during World War II. And he came out nine days after, and he had lost everything. Um, but he wrote the book, Man's Search for Meaning. And he pretty much said that that's the last of our human freedom, is to choose our attitude in any given set of circumstances. That man came out of losing everything next to his life and still said that my attitude is to not be a victim. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, no matter what, if you live here, you can get a job at Walmart, McDonald's, 
Like you still got room uh-huh. to build if you live here. <laughs> I, I mean that. I, I mean honestly, that's to me like the most amazing thing. You still, true. you still got room to build. And so if you have just a little bit of attitude and dare I say it, belief in God, you are good. <laughs> you just are. <laughs> I, I mean, you, you just are. <laughs> so, yes. you know, I, I just, where can people reach out to you if they want you to, to, to if they want your book, if they want to want you to speak somewhere, where, where, where can they get, give me, give me all your info. So, so my listeners can follow you. Oh, thank you so much. So the book is the, called the Samson effect. And it is all over. It's on Amazon. You can look it up. Um, we also have website is rockydetweiler.com or samson.life, L-I-F-E. Excellent. You guys Shelly can download our podcast as well. Yes. Yeah, go for that. Yes. Oh, listen, if you, um, yeah, you- go ahead. Yeah, you can you can find our our podcast, um, which is a radio show as well, but it's called Doing Business Right, and you can find that on any podcast uh, station. You know, uh, so that's live, and I think Cheryl gave the rest to you. So we're pretty easy to find Rocky dot com or Samson dot uh, and our book, The Samson Effect. So it's pretty easy to find us. We're not hard. Excellent. I was going to say, there's a Facebook Live. When you guys see it, po- if you post the links there, I'll make sure it's in the podcast as well. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. You're very welcome. You guys rock so hard. Love, love, love talking to you. Oh, thank you for having us on, Melanie. Thank you, Melanie. Awesome. Yes, you were excellent. Thank you so much. I appreciate, love you. I appreciate what you guys do so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for being such a great host. Oh, thank you. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette. That was Rocky and Cheryl Detweiler. They were fabulous, best-selling authors. Choose better words. Successfully navigate difficult conversations in business. Our next guest after the break is Dr. Nicole Kelly. She's going to talk to us about how to keep Me Too from becoming you too. We will be back in a few moments. Hey, this is Bill Wright. And I'm Shannon Wright. Join us for The Right Way with Shannon and Mike. Monday through Thursday, 7 to 9 a.m. Right here on SHR Media. Why are they joining us? For fun things like sports, politics. Oh, maybe some news and entertainment. And all kinds of other things. Money and recipes and events. All kinds of stuff. Yeah, so join us Monday through Thursday, 7 to 9 a.m. here on shrmedia.com. Welcome to Verizon Wireless. We're sorry, the number you have dialed has calling instructions that have prevented the completion of your call. Announcement 19. Welcome to Verizon Wireless. Liberals using truth, facts, and ridicule. The Lid Radio Show, featuring the conservative voice from the People's Republic of New York. The Lid himself, Jeff Dunnett. Tune in every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on the SHR Media Network. Go to shrmedia.com to Verizon and Ireland. Lid Radio. We fight for the truth, justice, and a good kosher TV. If you call. don't listen, Hillary Clinton might sneak into your bedroom in her housecoat late at night and blame you for her election loss. It's the Lid Radio Show with Jeff Dunnett. Hey girls, Carry Girl Gear is here. More and more women every day are concealed carrying, participating in competitive shooting, and getting firearms training. It's not a boys' club anymore, and we don't have to shop in their stores anymore either. Finally, a cool and unique clothing line just for women. Dope tees and hats for the patriotic concealed carry and 2A girl. So what are you waiting for? Go check out carrygirlgear.com today. 
It's your business diva here, Melanie Collette. I am inviting you to a front row seat as I discuss some of the most intriguing details of wealth and finance with today's movers and shakers in the world of business. Listen in and discover financial truths on a global, domestic, and household scale. Uncover topics that will impact your wallet today and in the future. Money Talk with Melanie airs Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. East, 2 p.m. West, right here on SHR Media and High Plains Pundit Talk Radio. You can't afford to miss it. New show on the SHR Media Network, Sackheads Against Tyranny. On shrmedia.com, go there quick like a bunny, 11 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific, every Wednesday, live and direct on the SHR Media Network, shrmedia.com, be there. For 50 years, I've seen the American people blinded by corrupt politicians, a left dog media, and deceptive Islam. The one thing the elites fear is one man with a cane. I'm Dave Milner. Join me through Spreaker, iTunes, and SoundCloud, through SHR Media and the Western Free Radio Network for half a century of experienced perspective on political and social issues, weekly on The Unpleasant Blind Guy. And catch me on Jeff Mitchell's EDL Radio on blogtalkradio.com. There's no surrender ever. Because truth is not always pleasant. Broadcasting behind enemy lines in occupied California, a mere two miles from the state capital, the bloviating Zeppelin's Berserk Bobcat Saloon Radio Show can be heard every Tuesday and Thursday night at 8 p.m. Pacific and 11 p.m. Eastern, only on the SHR Media Network. Go to shrmedia.com to listen. You can also watch on the SHR Media Facebook page and the SHR Media YouTube channel. No goldfish were abused in the making of this ad. Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network. And we're back. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette. I'm getting some kind of messaging error when I'm getting in touch with my guest. So hopefully, maybe she's going to call me. We'll see what happens i'm actually emailing her now to see uh what see if she maybe can call me instead of me calling her which is usually how i do it hopefully everybody is still here i actually do have a number of things to rant about where should i start if anybody um has been following me on twitter and i actually mentioned it a little bit in um my open um Let's see, when I, (laughs) uh, when I, I was on Twitter earlier and somebody said, um, somebody said that I, somebody said that I don't care. What did they say? I don't care what people look like. I don't see color and I don't care about my blackness. I don't care what I look like. I don't care what black people look like, or I think all people look the same or something like that. And I was like, what? It, you can call in if you want. I'll give you the number. You, you want to call in? Richard, you can. I'll give you the number. Hang on one second. Richard wants to call in. Um, I was like, I don't think all people look the same. I just don't think that that's paramount. I, and I don't get the... I, okay, so I, and I almost looked up. I almost looked up. The call-in number, if you want to call in, is 937-756-6639. I've never done that before, but you can try it. Um... um i just don't understand the theory behind um behind being proud of being black and i i meant to look up i meant to do this earlier being the academic that i am i meant to look up the definition of proud okay because being the academic that i am i'm like okay so what does it mean like, what's the definition of proud? That's what I wanted to know. 
Like, why do you have a reason to be proud? What's your reason to be proud? Because my definition, just like off the top of my head, of being proud of something means to like, okay, you work for something and then you have reason to be proud of it if you work for it. Okay, that makes sense to be proud of something you work for. But literally, I didn't work to um, be black. Like, I literally didn't do anything. Like, I was born (laughs) I was born and then that's how I got to be black that's it so like why is that anything to necessarily be proud of be proud of my heritage I didn't do anything in my heritage great black people that came before me did great things but I I didn't I'm proud of things that I have personally accomplished but the fact that I accomplished them while being black, why is that a thing? Did my melanin somehow deter me, distract me, um, cause a problem for me? Not that I'm aware of. Um, so I like, I, I, I I can't, like, I have a hard time trying to figure out. <laughs> you didn't get the last four digits? I posted it, like, three times. Okay, I'm going to post it one more time. There we go. <laughs> nine, nine, three, seven, seven, five, six, 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 three, nine. So, I like, I'm trying to figure out why I should be and I'm sure black people everywhere are going to be like really mad at me saying this, but like no one has said, I'm going to let you do this, even though you're black. Like that's never happened. So I, 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 I'm, I'm at a loss with that. I'm proud of things that I have personally accomplished. Not despite being black, just proud of things that I've personally accomplished. I'm proud of my degrees. I'm proud of things that I've accomplished. I'm proud that I stand in front of a classroom and teach kids. I'm proud of that because I used to have very horrible stage fright and anxiety. That's why I'm proud of that because it was really hard. It was really hard to do. Good afternoon. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. You're on with Money Talk with Melanie. Who am I speaking with? Uh, this is your old pal, Richard Herschel Griffin, Melanie. How are you doing well, today? Well, hi there, Richard Herschel Griffin. How are you? <laughs> I am wonderful. And how art thou? I am wonderful. I was talking about... Oh, we just went over that, didn't we? Never we mind. did. I, I, I was talking about how I was confused because someone on Twitter said that I had a problem with the fact that I was not proud of my blackness. And I was mm-hmm. speaking about things that I was proud of that I had accomplished and that I, I meant to look up the definition of proud and I was trying to figure out why I should be proud of being black because I had not legitimately done anything to be black. I was just like born black. Yeah. And, and, and like, I was proud that I was a teacher because um, I used to have very horrible stage fright and I used to not be able to talk ironic because I talk in front of people all the time now. And I took acting classes to get over that. And I used to have very horrible stage fright. Like my mom will tell you horrible stories about how I used to go to auditions and then not go to callbacks and stuff because I, used to throw up and lose my voice and all kinds of terrible things. Um, And so now it's kind of crazy that like I've done serious and talk in front of millions of people and I do speeches and all kinds of stuff now, but, uh, (laughs) but that was not always the case. Um, But I don't, I like, I cannot reason about being proud of being black in earnest. Just like just being black. I don't get it. Are you yeah. proud of being white? Like, are you proud of your whiteness? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I am very f- offended that you would assume my whiteness. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, <laughs> you could very well be something else. Like, I, I mean, I'm looking, I'm basing it on your picture. 
because of course we're Facebook <laughs> friends. Uh, you could very, I mean, I'm assuming your Caucasoidness, you could, you know. <laughs> My Caucasianality. Yes, that's it's, true. It's, it's, and of course you. right through, right through the computer screen into people's faces. That's and true. That be more offensive, you know, than anything else, I think. And I feel like if you tweeted, like, if we, if you and I both, like, at the same time tweeted, like I'm, if I tweeted I'm proud to be black, and you tweeted I'm super proud to be white, mm-hmm. I feel like we would get completely different responses. We would, and and you see that, and it's uh, it's it's an interesting thing that's happening that people are, on the one hand, you know, you can all day say I'm proud to be. Whatever you can say, I'm proud to be Irish, or you can you can say I'm proud to be Native American. But you know, somebody stands up and says, "Hey, I'm 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 proud to be white," and all of a sudden it's ooh. And I'm seventeen percent <laughs> Irish, by the way. Something like that. What? Like my great grandmother's half white. So oh, okay. Well, I personally <laughs> think you should proud. To, you, you should be most proud to be, uh, you know, hot. So. <laughs> <laughs> you should be proud of anything. Okay, but wait a minute. But wait, Richard. Okay, uh, <laughs> a, a, again. Okay, assuming that I'm hot, which is a show for another day. Why would I even be proud of that? Like that's like the gene pool lotto. Like why would I even be proud of that? Like I didn't. Again, I didn't do anything. That would be Carol and George. <laughs> like, I didn't. I didn't do anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, I think it's. I I think. Uh, you know where to begin with this? Should uh, the, the, let me back up a second and say that this person who tweeted you that you're not proud to be black. Why are they even worried about whether or not what you should be proud of? Just because they're proud of something in their life and they're proud of their whatever their skin color. Why should that even affect what you should be proud about? Because I, because you're two you're to, you're two totally different people. Because I'm not gonna be I'm not gonna be if I was if I was a basketball superstar, you know I would be proud of my basketball prowess. And somebody else who's a carpenter, they'd probably be proud of their carpentry skills. We're two totally different people. So why is it assumed that we should be proud of the same things just because? We share a same basic uh, because I, you know they'd be like me saying you're not proud of being a carbon-based life form like I am. Well, now you're just talking common sense. Well, here's what. Well, what happened was I said first of all, let's be clear because he first he accused me of making money hating black people, making a living off hating black people. I was like, first of all, let's be clear about wow. how I make my living. Okay, can we be clear about that, first of all? I said, right. number one, I make my living as an educator, primarily as an educator, adjunct professor, financial services, <laughs> financial services and political consultant, and I do media in that order. Okay. <laughs> that is how I make that's how I make my living. Okay? Yeah. Uh yeah. and I said, and quite honestly. None of that has to do with my race, and I prefer it that way. So, like, mm-hmm. what are you talking about? And I and, yeah. and, and I said, in, in, in the classroom, I teach financial literacy, and I, I try to speak victory into my students rather than victimhood. Yeah, I, I heard that segment. That was that was really awesome that you that you stood up and said that to your kids. I think that speaks a lot about your character as a person. Well, thank you. But I, I, you know, I I said, you know, I'm so glad that that's what I teach because I get the opportunity to do that. It's very important to me that I get the opportunity to do that um, because, you know, it's the one of the things that you get that you teach that I get to teach opportunity to them, you know, and I get to teach the one of the few things that says i don't care what happens to you it's an uh, you can start somewhere like i said yeah. to, to my previous guests mcdonald's is always hiring 
You can always yeah. start there. You can get one meal a day and work at McDonald's, yeah. and it is a start. It's a start, I, and I don't care how old yeah. you are. They're always hiring. Always. Well, you know, me personally, me personally, I, just, I don't mind if somebody, if you want to be proud to be black, then go ahead and do that. I mean, you do you, buddy. I mean, you because can be, but not, for what? Not, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> but, but I, my, what, what did you say now? I said you can be, but for what? Like, that's not an accomplishment. Yeah, I know, but, but the point is that if they want to be proud of that, then go ahead and do it. Um, but there's, and this leads into a discussion of there's so much more uh, uh, in the world to be proud of than than to lead. I think it's what if, if you lead with that, if you lead with saying I am proud to be black or I'm proud to be white, then then that's really uh, you're. It, it kind of leads to me to believe that you're kind of being very superficial about about things. You're just you're just worried about the surface area and not what's deep down inside. That's my personal point of view. Well, here's the thing about being proud to be black, and this is what and I got no no reply to this by the way. When you're proud to be black, the 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 underlying the, the underlying motive or theme to that is that somebody somewhere along the line told you that it was that being black was a bad thing and you believe oh, and oh. you believed it so somebody oh. said hold your head up high black man it's not a bad or black woman it's not a bad oh. thing to be black you can hold your head up high as a black person and that's not why you hold your head up high you know why you hold your head up high cuz Christ died for you mm. that's why but you hold I your think, head up high. I think, should, so, I think people, I think should, I think people should hold their heads up high because they are made in the image and likeness of God. That's Almighty. right. That's what I think. So and, and it's a if, misdirection. If you're starting out, if you're starting out from that viewpoint, you know, you and I got something to talk about. But if you're starting out from the standpoint of something very superficial, like skin color or or whatever else. Then it's the conversation is really not going to go anywhere because that speaks a lot more to your character than anything else, in my opinion. See, I really think um, Ron Edwards in the in the Facey chat said, "What's the motive?" I really think that the motive is for the enemy to mister to, to misdirect people. Right. That's what I think it division. is. That's I think right. it's a misdirection the from the enemy to to to, uh, to have to, to throw us off balance about what's important. The reason why yeah. we need to hold our heads up high is that our value is what God says our value is, and it's not in our skin exactly. color. I, I, and and the skin color, and that, and that. Oh man, that's such a brilliant point you just made, because it leads you to say, if if you're if you're looking at, at God's values, then then that's what you're cherishing most. You're cherishing the Creator's idea of who you are and what you should be but if you're saying i'm black and i'm proud then that's somebody else's opinion and yes, that opinion it is. changes from day to day and man boy that is that is that's a good thought right there somebody said to me the other day that i was just mad because god is black and i said what <laughs> i said why would i i said well what color is god now like you need to read your bible I said, I, yeah. said and I said, I asked a couple of questions. I said, what color is God now? I said, well, let me ask you this. I said, what color is God now? Right. <laughs> I said, what color are we going to be in the afterlife? I yeah, said, yeah, yeah. how does God ask us to worship him? Mm-hmm. Okay. I said, and none I can of guarantee you. None it has to you, do with superficial skin color. All, none of those has to do with our skin color. God is, no, God is, right. and somebody asked today on Facebook, how important is it what color um, Jesus was? And I, and my answer was his skin color is not important. His lineage was. Right. That's what was important. And, you know, and what's, and what's most important is that whoever you are, he died for you. Exactly. That, and, and, and that, and that leads to, that leads to what, Jesus did not worry about what skin color he was or what skin color you are. What he worried about was what he could do to draw you to him. And that is an accomplishment. That's not something superficial. That is something that you can grab onto and 
get right down deep into your soul. That it's, is an accomplishment worth worth celebrating. Exactly. As soon as I read somewhere that God cares what we look like, what we look like, then I'll be concerned uh, about that. Uh-huh. But He certainly does not. Well, He certainly cares what your soul looks like. You know. Exactly. <laughs> you know. And, and, and that's, that's, that's a deeper issue. It's these deeper issues of character, of accomplishment, of the person that you are on the inside. Even Jesus himself said, it's not what defi- what defileth a man is not what goes into his mouth, but what comes out. Remember, so it, it, <laughs> remember when the Jews and the Gentiles were arguing mm-hmm. over who was who in the New Testament, right. and Paul was writing to the congregations? To knock right, that foolishness right. off. Remember? <laughs> and that just goes back to people. Re- you, that's why you got to read the whole thing. Yeah. That's why you yeah. have to read that. That That's why you got to read the whole thing. You can't, you can't just take this one little part. And the Bible is such a great, you know, I'll wrap it up with this because we're about to preach a sermon here and have church right now. <laughs> but but the Bible, man, you've got to. You've got to balance it out. If you read something over here in one part of the Bible, you better go to the other section because we, we all have reference Bibles today, and it's very easy to flip over to the other parts that reference here and there. You've got to take the whole thing in context and really dig down deep. And uh, that goes back to what we're saying. you got to dig a little deeper than just superficial. Things right. Like that's, color. that's why when that, guy, when that kid was like, well, you're just mad because Jesus is black. I said, oh, really? Well, what color is he now? He ain't, he, if he think, was black, he ain't been black for a minute. I don't think you were, I don't think you were mad to begin with. Huh? I mean, he was just assuming you were mad. You know, and you're, you're sitting there laughing your, your, I was uh, like, why your face would, off at him. If he was, why would I be? Like it's yeah. completely yeah. irrelevant now. What? Like, yeah. <laughs> why would I? Who well, cares? Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? It's it's uh, it's it's um it's an it's idol worship worship <laughs> worship of self worship of skin color and not the more important <laughs> things of character and the deeper issues of the soul and the spirit. Yeah. And with that, I'll say good day and wrap it up. Have a great day. Man. Yes. If anybody else would like to call in, my, my, my nephew is on, is in the facey chat, Clinton Freeman. He was like, you, the, he didn't say I hated black people. Somebody else said I hated black people. My cousin Ty Glenn is in the facey chat. That would mean I hate her. That would mean I hate my nephew, who I, which I don't. Like, <laughs> I love my nephew. I love me some Ty Glenn and Ron Edwards. Ron Edwards black last time I checked. <laughs> I love me some Ron Edwards. If you would like to call in, the number is 937-756-6639. I would love for Ron Edwards to call in. Ron Edwards is wonderful. We love him. You can call him if you if you want. I see Levon Wilson is in the facey chat. I see Mike is in the facey chat. Let's see who else is in there. But uh, yeah, I couldn't. My, when I was trying to call my guest, I actually really wanted to talk to her too because she. The subject matter was how to keep me too from becoming you too. I actually would like to talk to Ron Edwards about that. I would love to talk to Ron Edwards about that. I bet we would have a fantastic conversation about that because I think that me and Ron Edwards, I actually, I really don't think that me and Ron disagree on that. I just think Ron likes to argue with me about that subject matter. I really do. Because Ron automatically goes, if I say anything about ever being touched inappropriately, he's like, do you want to live under Sharia law? I'm like, okay, Ron, like you're kind of going from one extreme to the other (laughs) just a little bit. (laughs) You're just going from one extreme to the other. But I I know my nephew is a gentleman and is on his best behavior at all times. He better be. No, I'm sure he is. But yeah, like we... Uh, always D- Doug Doug can call in of course if you if he wants to but um yeah I don't know what happened what happened to my guest I tried to call her oops wait a minute let's see maybe she'll try uh tested the phone to make sure it was working up oh, I'll try her I'm gonna try her cell see if it works I see that she let's see 
I apologize for that. I'm going to try a different phone. Let's we'll see if it works. Mm. It's ringing. Hello? Hello. Hi. This is M Melanie from Money Talk with Melanie. How are you? I'm great. Fantastic. Oh, I'm so glad I was able to get you. I took I actually <laughs> took, a, took another uh, call. Pardon me? Technology. I know, right? I got some kind of weird <laughs> um, message that said there was some restriction or something like that, but I'm happy to have you on the line now. Good deal. Me too. Yep. Uh, I was just so, so one of my uh, one of my frequent uh, listeners called in. So uh, for those of you who are listening and in the Facey chat, I do now have uh, Dr. Nicole Kelly. She's an author, uh, and uh, we're discussing uh, keeping Me Too from becoming You Too. Uh, I, I love this topic, by the way. Is yeah, it, yeah, it's very important, very timely. Um, if you, if you would like, can you give the audience, uh, just a quick, um, uh, some quick information about your background? Uh, absolutely. So, um, I am actually a hospice geriatrician, so I take care of the frailest of the frail. Um, and my main focus was taking care of patients and talking with families. And unfortunately, um, I should have been listening to your show and taking better care of my business side. Uh, because I always kind of didn't like that side and didn't pay attention to that side. And I trusted um, a nurse who was an employee of mine who claimed that she could change my business around, take it to the ne next level. She was going to do so many wonderful things for my business. And she turned out to be a sociopath and embezzled over $700,000 for my medical practice. Oh, you're kidding me. <laughs> no, it was... It brought my business to the brink of bankruptcy. And I tried to sue her, and I was already several tens of thousands of dollars into the lawsuit when the lawyer turned to me and said, look, you have a very strong case. I think you're going to win, but it's going to be at least six figures till we get to the end of this, and she'll just declare bankruptcy. Then the banks will get their money first, and you're not going to get anything. Wow. So instead. Ugh. That's horrible. Yeah, but I turned the nightmare into a positive thing and decided to educate the public about sociopaths, psychopaths, and sexopaths, which are sociopaths or psychopaths with a sex addiction, which I think is the medical condition behind the Me Too movement that no one's talking about. That the reason that people like Harvey Weinstein, Bill Cosby, that they treat women like objects is because they don't have the capacity to experience empathy and they don't have a conscience. So they're sexiopaths. Right. And what is entailed in being a sexiopath? You honestly, you're honestly saying that they have, they cannot control themselves. Well, they still have the ability to make choices. Okay. Absolutely. But, um, the sociopaths and psychopaths, their brains are wired differently. So they've actually done functional MRI studies, PET scans, showing that the connections that the rest of us have that give us empathy, gives us the ability to feel what another person feels, and a conscience, that little voice that in our head tells us, urges us to do what's right and moral, they don't have that. Which is so hard for most of us even to imagine but if you think about it, most of us spend so much of our time thinking about empathy, thinking about are we doing enough for our family? Are we helping our friends? Are we, we spend a lot of time, you know, do they like us? Am I working hard enough? Sociopaths and psychopaths don't do that. They don't care about that, which means they have a lot of extra time on their hands, which is actually why they do very well in business and politics and all sorts of other positions of power. Um, because empathy doesn't slow them down. They're not thinking about others. Everything is focused just on how can they personally get ahead. But having no empathy also means that they get bored. One of the things they hate the most is to be bored. They can't stand it. It's like painful for them. And lots of times they'll feel that boredom with addictions, sex being one of them. But they're often alcoholics. They often have sex addictions. 
Um, they have gambling problems, drug addictions, just to feel the boredom of not having empathy. Now, are these the men who touch in a per- like? Do they need not not to be necessarily too graphic? Do they necessarily need actual sex? Is touching sufficient? Like, are these the guys? You know, listen. As a woman, I, I can just go there. Are these the guys that just touch you inappropriately? Do they need actual sex? Like, I mean, it depends on the sociopath. Okay, so. Absolutely, some of them. In fact, uh, there's a famous one who wrote a book, James Fallon, um, where he's a neurobiologist who did studies, and then by accident, <laughs> he was one of the controls, found out that his brain looked like a psychopath. Um, and then as he delved further into his own psyche, he realized that sure enough, he did have very low empathy and um, had many characteristics of a sociopath or psychopath. And his deal was he would never sleep with women, but he really enjoyed getting them to the point that they wanted to. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, but it was about the manipulation and the control. Oftentimes that's even more important than the release. Wow. Because, I I mean, I'll say in my own personal experience, I feel like, I mean, I, I, at, at this point, I almost feel like I'm desensitized to being touched inappropriately. Like, that's how I feel. Like, Aww. seriously. Like, it's like, that's because, sad. because I'm very, I'm, I'm a very curvy woman. And it's almost like, and I'm almost 50 years old. And at this point, like, unless it's super aggressive, at this point, I'm like desensitized to it. It's like, it doesn't. It almost doesn't even bother me anymore. Like that that's how much it's happened. So it's like <laughs> it's like I can't on society. It it's be like way. I can't even afford to get angry because I'm a busy woman. Like I just don't I don't have time. <laughs> like I just I, like I just uh, I just don't. Like I have to like I, I like I have to make decisions about how I'm gonna spend my time and I just it's just something I don't have time to address. I, I just don't. But, and I, like, I can't even get angry anymore. If I, if I thought, think about it, I will, I, I'll be legitimately angry, but I, I don't have time. <laughs> I, like, I, I know, like, it's funny, but it's not funny. You know what I mean? I know, but it's not funny. I mean, it's, it's actually horrible how it, awful that you would become desensitized to, to, you know, your own basic rights of other people not invading your space or touching your body. Right. And how sad we've reached that point in our society. I mean, it, it, well, and, it's and, time to change. And then the thing is, you you actually know, you know, as a woman and as, like, I'm almost 50 years old. Like, I know nothing's going to happen. Like, unless you hurt, unless you really hurt me or really do something, you know nothing's going to happen. Like, you're not even, like, I've had way worse happen. And all the guy got was a fine. So, like, what's the point? Like, well, why? I mean, even... the point is, the point is, is that, um, I mean, sociopaths have an Achilles heel, which is the empathetic majority can bind together and expose them for who they are. Like, so... calling them and speaking together and telling other people of what they're doing and not standing for it anymore is going to create change. Possibly. Possibly. Yeah, pro- I mean, you're <laughs> probably right. I feel I feel like I don't I don't know about you and other if other women feel this way, but I just kind of avoid certain social situ just don't go out all that much and just kind of resort, you know, cuz you're just like <laughs> just like you just know Certain things are going to happen if you're, you know what I mean? You just. I mean, that's just that sad state of affairs. It is. It is. And then, like, if you complain, you feel, I, I, feel, I feel anyway, and I don't know if other men, women have expressed this to you, but you kind of feel like if you complain that a lot of men don't really have much empathy for that. And it's just like, well, you're a girl, deal with it. 
<laughs> like, <laughs> or like that's what you get for not having a husband. The same way. Huh? Yeah. If it were happening to them, I don't think they'd feel the same way. Right. And like, I'm a single woman. So it's kind of like, well, that's what you get for not having a husband. Like, what? <laughs> I mean, that's ridiculous. I uh, agree. I think it's ridiculous, too. Standard. Huh? Yeah. What a horrible double standard. I, I I agree. I think it is a horrible double standard. We're talking standard. about it. See, we're talking about it now, and maybe this can make a difference in somebody's life. Maybe I hope it does. will be like, hey, we need to talk to each other about this and stand together. Because that's what's been so great about this movement is the, is the strength in women coming together and supporting each other. Do you think that the the, the entire, like, I, I'm not, I, I think the Me Too movement in the beginning was important. I don't co-sign the entire agenda. I think that the entire agenda kind of went a few steps too far. I think the beginning of it was good. Like just kind of speaking out about the the silence of, of what was right. going on, like women, be, the, the silence that was there, like you know, women right. just right. not talking about what was going on. Well, you we, know, the fact we need that, to keep talking about it. But I mean, you're absolutely right too. There is the potential for abuse. I mean, one important thing that's in my book too is that you know, majority of sex paths are men, but they can be women too. Oh, absolutely. And one who embezzled for me was also a sexopath, and she's female. So, I mean, that there is nothing to say that there can be false claims from female sexopaths trying to get power and control by casting blame on blameless men. And that's really, you know, somebody who has two nephews, you know, that that's a fearful thing. And exactly. I, I know men that that's happened to. And, you know, frankly, I think that, you know, the reason – why men get away with it is the same reason why women lie. It's very hard to prove. Right. So, you know, and, and it's a horrible thing to do to a good man, you know, to, to lie on exactly. somebody. Exactly. Because that's, that's the key to dealing with sociopaths and psychopaths is transparency and accountability. Exactly. Exactly. And, it, you know, it, it's a terrible it's a, such a difficult discussion because I, I know many just very good men, you know, and I have this discussion with them all the time and they're angry because they've been falsely accused. You know, I'm angry because I, I you know, the, the experiences that I've had and it's, it's a hard conversation for good people to have with each exactly. other. You know, because most people are good. I mean, it, it's the smaller percentage, which actually isn't as small as people think. I mean, as many as uh, one in 25 people fall on the sociopath spectrum. But most people are good. It's really just learning to identify those whose brains function differently. I mean, they are not following the same rules or existing in the same reality the rest of us are for us to start to see a change. It's, it's incredible. You know, I said to, I, I have a lot of guy friends and I, and one day I was having a conversation with a few of them. It was just me and two of my guy friends. And I said to them one day, we were all doing like a, a Zoom conference. And I said, you know, with the statistics being what they are, I find it ironic that none of you know any guys that have done this to women. I said, you know, I have a lot of guy friends, and yet no guys seem to know any other guys who have done this to women, right? So I was, I was kind of joking with them about it. And uh -huh. they said, they said, yeah, well, you know what the statistics are on pornography, yet none of us know, know any other guys who watch <laughs> porn, right? <laughs> so, and they were laughing. Yep. And yep. they said, yeah, we don't, we're not women we don't talk about every we don't talk about everything we're not like girls <laughs> and i was like okay point well taken and he's like yeah we don't talk about everything we talk about sports and sports <laughs> like us <laughs> we don't he's like it's not like something we would tell another guy if we did that like that's he's like do you honestly think like if we force ourselves on a woman we 
like that's something we would tell our bro like we wouldn't we would never say tell somebody that and i'm like okay that's a good point like it never that never occurred to me like why would you tell somebody something that horrible you wouldn't right yep so and that's i mean and it's like so so i i guess it's incumbent upon women to just what keep saying it right i mean we've broken the silence but the silence can't come back again i mean that's the the trap that's out there is to go back into the silence but i I really think a change is happening i think people are waking up i mean they they're ready for a change so uh, we just have to keep demanding transparency and accountability and how do you demand that transparency what does that transparency look like well it means that for example if you're in the workplace and you catch somebody in a lie i mean we are we have politeness so beaten into our heads that we just let it slide and even if you don't want to call someone out right in front of everybody go talk to other people about the fact look i just caught this person in a lie so often nobody talks about it we make excuses for the sociopath a lot of times because we want to keep the first impression. Sociopaths make a really great first impression. That's why they're the charming cheaters. It's because they are charismatic, bigger than life, and they put on a mask that is exactly what you want to see. And so then when they give you evidence that is contrary to that beautiful image they presented in the beginning, we make excuses for them. We need to not do that. Be willing to question your first impression. Be willing to talk to other people when you catch people in lies, when you catch inconsistencies. Those are some of the red flags that you may be dealing with someone who doesn't have a conscience and doesn't experience empathy. Not that they're evil, but they do have the potential to do evil. That's interesting. They're not, they don't experience empathy. What are some examples of that? Well, so they can't feel what another person is feeling. So here's an, in, what they'll do is um, they'll mimic other people's emotions. Uh, so I was working with a sociopath who um, she was giving an example of her daughter running over a dog. She's telling the story, just kind of flatly telling the story. And then she realizes that other people in the room are upset about the dog. Like I watched her face realize, oh, I'm supposed to act empathetic about the dog and then she changed her whole expression and then talked about the dog that's just an example it's just a silly example of how she didn't realize how other people were going to feel empathy about the story she was telling and then she changed her expression and her story to be the mask for the group wow yep so it suddenly occurred to her that Hey, a dog died, another, a living thing died, and it probably was a painful death. Maybe I should show some empathy here. Nope, no, not that. She didn't realize that. That never hit her. All that hit her was, oh, the other people care about the dog. Let me put on the right face for these people who care about the dog. She never cared about the dog. She never thought about the dog. She never empathized with the dog. She merely read the room and changed her performance accordingly wow okay that's a problem i don't know that i've ever met a person like that that (laughs) you have you just don't know it one in 25 people so most of us run into one every single day and don't even realize it i probably left the room if i if i ran into a person like that <laughs> People like that scare me. I probably was like, okay, gotta go. <laughs> well, but you won't realize it. They'll actually be very, very charming. They'll actually seem like a really great, you know, charismatic person. Lots of times they give lots to charities. Lots of times they're doing all sorts of things that seem like really good things, but deep down in their soul, they're cold and callous and have no conscience. It, you know, I try to, those are the people that you're, that like later on down the line, you're trying to figure out like, wow, how could that person do that? And and, exactly. and, that, and that's how. Yep, exactly. In fact, talking to a lot of people, um, they'll talk about the one who got away. 
And then as we talk about sociopaths, they'll realize, oh, wow, that one that got away was a sociopath. That's when the one that got away was a good thing. Well, sometimes uh, because the way it works is the relationship starts, everything is roses, it's fantastic. You have met your soulmate. This is like the best person you have ever met, ever. And it's because they're putting on a mask to be the perfect partner that you want. And they probe you, like they ask you all sorts of questions to find out what are you looking for, and then they put on the mask to give you just that. Then in the next phase, starts sort of a hot and cold phase, kind of a devalue phase where they're kind of training you. And um, this is where they'll be nice one minute, and then they're mean the next, where you're kind of on your toes, not understanding, and thinking, what am I doing? I'm doing something wrong. I, I, where did the I, idealized phase go? Where's the honeymoon? What have I done? And then all of a sudden, They'll just drop you like a piece of garbage. You won't have any clue who's coming. Usually it's in a very mean way that seems totally out of character with that amazing person that you first met. And you just, I mean, go into a horrible depression thinking that you did something terribly wrong to ruin the best relationship you ever had. And what you don't realize is the whole thing was just an illusion. It really was not real. That person was not who he pretended to be. Interesting. Interesting. I'm trying to that 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 is ac- actually frightening that there are people out there who are who are legitimately like walking around in everyday in everyday life. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. you, you know what I mean? That that's that's Absolutely. that's super scary. That people are walking around at, you know what I mean? That are, people are walking around like that. That are acting Absolutely. like that. I mean, that. for them, everything is a game. Every every single time they meet someone new, they are immediately evaluating for vulnerabilities. It is all just a game and thinking about how can I manipulate this person to get what I want. So this is a mental problem, but is this also a, is, is this a physical mental problem the same way that you see changes in the brain with depression and changes like like other changes in the brain well so there is definitely a genetic predisposition so people are born with the predisposition to turn out this way and the thinking is potentially that environment determines how much these genes are expressed meaning how you were raised geological right. so whether you had abuse whether you know, verbal or physical abuse uh, poor nutrition. Uh, a lot of people say, because there are a lot more sociopaths in Western society than Eastern society, that Western society actually supports sociopaths because you can do better in business. You can do better in politics. You can do better in corporations by being a sociopath in Western society, whereas in Eastern society, you know, stepping on the backs of others to get ahead is kind of frowned upon. That's very interesting. Because, you know, I had a guest on not too long ago uh, who talked about, (laughs) he was talking about how things are different in the East. Um, uh, We were talking about uh, trade in China. And he said that I was talking about how in the East they steal our uh, intellectual property. And the guest said that they consider it sharing. And I said, does the East realize that we do not consider that sharing? <laughs> <laughs> that we consider that stealing. Do they understand that we consider that right. stealing? Yep. Not sharing, that that's not our viewpoint? Do they understand that? <laughs> right, it's a fundamental cultural difference. Right, and that's, that's what he said, that it's a cultural, he said, do you, you know, do you realize that it's a cultural difference, it's not really... It's not a business difference. It's a cultural difference that they think they're sharing. I said, what? Mm -hmm. I said, well, do they know that that, that we don't feel that way? (laughs) (laughs) It was actually a really funny conversation. (laughs) (laughs) But it's funny that you should say that, that that's, you know, they they feel like we're we're sharing and like the United States is just really being stingy. Like, what? So that's just, but yeah, like if you have like zero empathy, I could see how business would not be a problem. 
Absolutely. Because you do, do what you need to do to get the head. You're not thinking of the common good, what's better for everyone. I mean, another big thing about sociopaths and psychopaths is they do not believe that rules apply to them, which is why they are very attracted to politics. Washington, D.C. has the most psychopaths in the entire nation. That's huh. the highest concentration. <laughs> they're attracted to positions of power. I'm not talking Democrats or Republicans. I'm just talking politicians in general. Listen, they get to make the rules. I'm involved in politics. Trust me, I feel you. I feel every bit of that's the realest thing that's been said on my show in a long time. <laughs> it is very, I, I mean, I'm involved on the worker bee end of it. And when people, <laughs> listen, when people ask me about running for anything higher than local politics, I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> it's, it's look no <laughs> absolutely not um so, somebody in the facebook chat said do you feel this is a great question actually do you feel social media has caused that problem to increase simply because it's such a me me world on social media that's a good question uh, yeah that's a great question and uh for for sure it has and um Online dating is actually a great area for sociopaths to find prey. I mean, that that's a place where they go to find targets to victimize um, because lots of times they're lonely people on um, online dating sites and they can put on whatever face they want to see, be their perfect mate for long enough to take them for all they can and manipulate and abuse them. Very true. And people uh, can just be really mean on social media. Mm -hmm. Like, what? Like, wow. Just, so, I've seen the meanest stuff. People have said the meanest things to me on social media. Like, wow. Just mean. Just, yeah. so, I, 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 like, whoa. I, like, getting their empathy and humanity. Yeah, I, especially, like, if I've done something, like, national TV or something, like, just super mean, incredible, uh, just the nastiest stuff. I'm like, how do you, I don't understand. <laughs> just really, like, I would never, some stuff that I, I would just never say to another human being. Like, what, what are you doing? I don't, I, 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 yeah, I understand. Things about what my mother thinks of me that are woefully unkind. Um, <laughs> oh, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is. It's like the anonymous nature of social media that people, you know, who do have empathy forget it for a while, but then, I mean, the 4% of the population who doesn't have empathy then feels free to take control and be manipulative and, Spread evil. So. I, but st uh, I'm thinking, but still, you're talking. Okay. So you don't agree with their political perspective. Okay. But a waste of black skin? Like, oh, I, like okay. Uh, like, uh, so, like, how do you leap? Like, where do you take the. <laughs> I'm very rarely speechless, right? So where do you take the leap from, wow, I really don't agree with her political perspective. She's a waste of black skin. Humanity. Right. <laughs> it's still respect another human being, their emotions and their feelings. Right. That's just that's out of line. I don't, I don't agree with your political perspective. I bet your mom hates you. Like, how do you get from there? Like, I'm looking at the map of the humanity map, trying to figure out where on a humanity map you walk from. I don't agree with your political perspective, too. Oh, there's your mom must hate you. Like, what? I, I don't know. I do not. I can't figure it out. I, I, I think empathy must be must be on that map, and, and it's not on theirs. Must be what it is. Yep. Must be what it yep. is. They need, they need a healthy dose of it because they're missing it. That it, yeah, and I don't I don't quite I don't I don't understand that. 
I don't get it. I don't understand it. And and that must be what's wrong with them, or it's not in their brain and it's in mine. I don't get it. But it, it but you see it on social. You see the most hateful things um, on social media. And it was a great question from John. Just the most what my grandmother would re- refer to as hateful. And I really didn't understand when my grandmother would use that word. Like whenever she would say that's just hateful. And I, I when I when she would use that word. I always knew like it meant something really, really bad. And I never had a measurement for it. I was like, what is hateful? I've never seen hateful or understood hateful. Now I know what she means. (laughs) Social, social media has now presented the measuring stick for hateful. Cause now I, I never came in contact really with hateful until social media, I think. Because I was like, wow, what's hateful? I don't think I've ever came in contact with anything that bad. Hateful. Right. Just And maybe maybe this is part of the solution. It is us talking about it and other people talking about it. And when somebody says something like that, you know, to follow up with, you know, look, I may not agree with her political position too, but you're not lying. To call them on it and be that is not acceptable. We we do not need that as a society. We, we have come too far. We're, this is a sliding backwards. Stop it already. Right. I usually, I usually just respond with something like classy and smile or something like that. Like, I don't even, <laughs> but I, like, I do not, I never return. I was just, I was raised better. I just don't, exactly. like, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I have, I had parents. So I, (laughs) like, I I would never, I just would never, um, I would never disrespect my family or parents or myself by responding in kind. I just would not, not do that. You, you will never see anything like that on my social media. It's ridiculous. Um, (laughs) where, where can, is, 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 I have a rule, never let anybody else change who you are. That that's my exactly. Role. I'm I'm yep. who I am. There's a word to live by. Absolutely. Yep. Where can you can't control anybody else, but you can control yourself. I can control me exactly. Yep. Where can um, my audience find information about you? Contact you? Any of your books? Your information? Where can they do that? Well, so my book, Charming Cheaters: Protect Yourself from the Sociopaths, Psychopaths, and Sexopaths in Your Life, is available on Amazon. Um, I have also written a novel that is the ultimate anti-hero based on, uh, fiction of course, but based on loosely the woman who embezzled for me who was also on a cheater's website sleeping with five different married men at the same time. Ew. Anyone, yeah, anyone who buys Charming Cheaters um, can have access to the novel for free on my website, www.nicolekellymd.com. And on the website, I also have a free spotting tool, which uses the acronym Glimpse Behind the Mask that gives you the 20 most common characteristics of sociopaths, psychopaths, and sexopaths. Nice. Excellent. Can you, if you emailed me the, the links to that already, right? Right. Okay, cool. I'll make sure it's in the podcast. Excellent. All right. Great. All right. Thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Yep, indeed. Uh, thank you. Every- true to you. Yep. Uh, I want to thank everybody for listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I want to thank both of my guests, Dr. Nicole Kelly. She's an author, and she uh, talked to us today about how to keep for me too from becoming you too. And I want to thank Rocky and Cheryl Detweiler for being with me the first hour. I want to thank all of my sponsors for supporting Money Talk with Melanie. Did I mention everybody in the first hour? I didn't mention in the second hour. I want to thank John Campbell with Banner Season. You can hook up with him at bannerseason.com forward slash main forward slash register personal touch. Eva Rosenberg, a.k.a. The Tax Mama. Robert Houston at creditrepair.biz. And new sponsor, uh, 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 come on, Ralph, <laughs> Reverend Ralph Chittums at urbanred.org. Thank you so much for supporting Money Talk with Melanie. SHR Media, thank you so much. If you are downloading this via iTunes or any other podcast platform, thank you, thank you, thank you. Remember, 
all of this is very important because after all, this is your money. No, after all, it's your money. Have a fantastic weekend. Bye-bye.